uh, the introduction, of course, yeah. because uh, all of them. Um, good. So our first speaker is Sharon Marteau. From, uh, he's a PhD student from Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and he will tell us about non hyper surfaces and the electron-relativistic physics in gravity. Um, good, good afternoon. I'm already presented, so I'm going to repeat it. So I'm going to um, to present a connection between non hypersurfaces and uh, ultra relativistic physics. Um, so this is a work based on a paper that I published with another PhD student in Paris, Luca Chambrini. And um, so <coughs> first, what is ultra relativistic? So in the literature, it is often referred to as Carolian physics, um, and it is when the, sp the speed of light is sent to zero. So this is a weird limit, but this is the it is the dual limit to the Galilean limit, where the speed of light is sent to infinity. Um, so the first appearance of the word the word Carol. So this is a this refers to the author Lewis Carroll, and he was uh, dubbed by Jean-Marc Leblanc who's a French uh, mathematician, and he had the idea to study the ultra-relativistic limit of the Poincaré group. So this work was just a, a sort of pedagogical work. The idea was to build the unitary irreducible representation of this group. But, and then it had no uh, physical uh, <coughs> application uh, for many years. But recently, uh, people have started to understand that this could have a this could play a role in asymptotically flat gravity. And the main result being that the, the BMS group, so the, the symmetric group of asymptotically flat gravity, uh, can be shown to be isomorphic to the conformal Carroll group in three dimensions. <coughs> and those three dimensions would be the dimension of the null infinity of asymptotically flat space. And then later, people have started to understand that actually any null hypersurface can be understood as a Carolian uh, space-time. And our goal with my collaborator was, was to extend these results <coughs> about the symmetries to the dynamic of asymptotic flat gravity. So first, what is the Carroll group? So consider a d plus one dimensional space-time and perform the c goes to zero contraction of this group. You end up with another group, and here I've, I've presented the, the coordinates transformation that you already did. Um, so what we see is that the boosts in space have disappeared. You can only boost time through the vector d. And you can also do a space-time translation. So this is really a, a, the dual, uh, it's, a, it's, it's opposed to the Galilean group where you can boost uh, space through uh, <coughs> velocity, but you can't boost time, time is absolute. Whereas here, somehow space is absolute. So this is a priori a very interesting goal. But I will be interested in something more general uh, an object that I call Carolian diffeomorphism. So those diffeomorphisms <coughs> mimic what we've seen before in the sense that time can be taken to a function of time and space, but space is absolute and can be only taken to a function of space. So for such, so it's a subset of all the diffeomorphisms, and they have a particular Jacobian that has a vanishing component. And what we are going to, to look for are theories that are covariant under this subset of diffeomorphism only. And such theories can be obtained by taking the ultra-relativistic limit of a general covariant theory. So usually, general covariant theories are coupled to a space-time metric. Just, yes? Little clarification. Yeah. When you say ultra-relativistic, yeah. you really mean greater than the speed of light, b greater than c? Um, are you saying B? No, B, B stays B smaller C. than C, but C goes to <coughs> C. Okay, so you're not actually crossing, you're not becoming no. a tachyon. No, no. Okay, fine. Thanks. All speeds are comparable to the speed, speed of light. Okay. Um, 
So yes, so, so the space-time metric can be decomposed to the so-called rendered Papa Petrou uh, metric parametrization. And this parametrization uh, involves uh, a scalar omega, a spatial one form, and a spatial metric. So through the transformation of the metric with respect to the diffeomorphism, I can deduce the transformation of those three objects under the subset of the diffeomorphism, the Carolian diffeomorphism. So and I see that the <coughs> spatial metric transforms really like a spatial metric, that's why I put it like that. B transforms like, a, like a, con a sort of connection, so I will call it the temporal connection. And omega, the time lapse, transforms like, like a scalar density. And the idea, so let me precise something, is that if I take the ultra relativistic limit of a general covalent theory, this theory won't be uh, coupled to a space-time metric, but will be coupled to those three geometrical objects separately, and that won't be packaged in, in some uh, space-time metric. But before taking the limit, if I consider uh, a, uh, a theory coupled to a metric, I can uh, build a space-time energy momentum tensor. This one is given by the variation of the action with respect to the space-time metric. And I will do the same thing than what I did before for the metric. I will decompose it into, a vari into three objects, epsilon, capital A, and pi. And those three objects are going to transform covariantly under the Carolian diffeomorphism. So epsilon will be a scalar, phi uh, a vector, and capital A a symmetric potential. So for general covariant theories, uh, diffeomorphism invariance ensures that the energy momentum tensor is conserved. And I can now perform the C goes to zero limit of this equation. This will split out into two equations, one scalar and one uh, spatial. So we, see, we, we can't write it as a, as a general covariant theory, but this will happen to be a general covariant equation, but this will happen to be covariant under this subset of the diffeomorphism <coughs> that I've described at the, at the beginning. So this involves only the three geometrical objects, the time lapse, the temporal connection, and the spatial metric and is linear in epsilon, uh, capital A, and pi, that I will call the Carolian momenta. Those are the equivalent, those are the ultra-relativistic version of an energy momentum tensor. So now we'll turn our attention to asymptotically flat gravity, and the goal being to show that the dynamic of asymptotically flat gravity can be mapped to this kind of conservation law, which is the equivalent, is just the ultra relativistic version of the conservation of an energy momentum tensor. So, what do I mean by asymptotically flat space time? So, far from the source, the metric can be approximated by the Minkowski space time. Uh, here it is written in a particular uh, system of coordinates. R is a radial coordinate u is a retarded time, and xi's are the two <coughs> angular coordinates on the two sphere. And then I can do an expansion in 1 over r, which is a radial coordinate, and the various coefficients <coughs> are going to contain information about the source. So for example, for, for a black hole, for a Kerr black hole, uh, mb, which is the bond mass here, would be the mass parameter, and I would be the, the angular momentum, which is constant. But here, those coefficients, I allow them to be function of the retarded time and the two angular coordinates. So this is the gravitational wave aspect, <coughs> this is the bond mass, and this is the angular momentum aspect. Now we can wonder what is the symmetry group of such a gauge. The gauge, by the way, is called the, the Bondi gauge. And there are two ways to obtain uh, the symmetry group. One that is uh, usually very well known, 
but the other one is a bit, uh, not, not a lot of people know it. But the, so the first one is to consider the asymptotic killing of this gauge, which means that I consider the vector field in the bulk that, um, that approximate to killing far from the source. And more precisely, what they do is that they will take this metric, this shape of metric, to the same shape in the new system, coordinate system, but allow the function c and b and, and i, so the gravitational wave paper and the mass, and the angular momentum aspect to, to vary. So if you work out those uh, vector fields, you obtain, um, you can uh, write them, so write their expansion in terms of two objects, y, which will be a conformal killing, an exact conformal killing of the two sphere. Um, so it's, it will span the SL to C algebra. And in the book, it represents the usual point carré, uh, the usual Lorentz smooth. <coughs> While T is any, function, any smooth function on the two sphere. And it is a sort of generalization of the translation, in the space time translation in the book. And so if T can be any function, it means that this algebra is infinite dimension. But there's another way to get this uh, algebra. And so the idea is to consider the region R equal infinity. So this is the null infinity. And imagine that it is a Carolian space time. So I can endow it with a, a time lapse, a, tempor a temporal connection, and a spatial metric. So the temporal connection will be um, will be one, and the, um, the spatial metric will be the round metric on the two sphere. Now I will look for vector fields on the null infinity, so they have only legs on the partial u and partial i, and ask them to be conformal killing of the, the Carolian geometry. So they take omega and, and little a, to the same, but with a conformal factor. And the solution to these two equations reproduce exactly the, the BMS algebra. And the mapping between the two of them is that psi hat is just the asymptotic healing, but evaluated on the null infinity. So this was a result about the symmetries and we are going to turn our attention to the dynamics now. So <coughs> if I con consider linear as gravity for asymptotic flat space time, um, so the Einstein's equation um, reduces to equation on the null infinity, in the, in the sense that the R coordinate has disappeared. So there is one scalar that involves the point mass and the gravitational wave aspect, and one spatial with respect to the sphere that involves the, the angular momentum, the, the point de mass, and the gravitational aspect. Those start to look very similar to the Carolian conservation law <coughs> I had described at the beginning. Sorry, what, 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 what was capital delta? Um, it's um, that nabla i, nabla i. Oh, oh, oh. So the capital delta there, um, and delta minus one. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Nabla i, nabla i. Oh, okay. Because I had that. <coughs> um, so, as before, when we, we found the, 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 this other way to obtain the BMS algebra, I consider that the null infinity is a Carolian space time, and I assign him the same uh, Carolian geometry. And I can recover those two previous <coughs> equations from Carolian conservation law if I consider this set of Carolian momenta. These are really the equivalent, they are the ultra relativistic <coughs> version of an energy momentum tensor. Excuse me, can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yep. Uh, there's a consistency relation between, you know, between the angular momentum, while the mass and gravitation. I wonder, in your geometry, is there any observation of signature that is just different than, you know, than ordinary space or 
I mean, have you have you thought about how you you can distinguish your mother observationally or observationally? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't understand your question. I just because uh, here you just see I J is the gravitational wave, right? Like what you said. Yeah. So there is a relation that connects all of them together, right? This so one? if I just yeah in your model. In so my model. I mean, in bonding model. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay. So I want to know: Is there any observation of signature for that a particular gravitational wave compared to the normal one? Yes. Okay, we can the memory. The memory. You do a unigral of this guy. Ah. What is the constraint between the low frequency radiation and the change in the body mass for one mm -hmm. example? Right, so that's yeah. my question. Yeah, so is, if you go exactly to, for example, like, I mean, not like, I mean, if you really look oh, for yeah, the signature, can you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So can yeah. you tell us? Because oh, I'm not an expert. No, I mean, it's just a in, whole other little. I don't, I don't know <coughs> how to how to tell okay, you how sorry. to measure this. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. Um, there are several points that I want to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are several papers on it, though. Sorry. There are several papers on it. Yeah. So. You can have a look at this picture. <laughs> I, mean, I will have a look also. <laughs> um, yeah, so, let, so now we can have a, some sort of physical interpretation of the roles of this object that I've introduced in the bomb cage, but through the Carolian momentum. <laughs> So if epsilon is an energy density, it is related to the bond mass and receives correction from the gravitational wave aspect, so from radiations at null infinity. Um, pi can be understood as a sort of heat current, and it is directly related to the angular momentum. Now I've split the the third Carolian momenta that was the symmetric two tensor into its trace and its traceless part, so the pressure and the dissipative tensor. So again, the, the pressure is also related to the bond mass and receives correlation from the radiation, while the dissipative tensor uh, receives contribution un only from the radiation. So now something interesting is happening because one can show that if the ultra-relativistic theory is conformally invariant, I need to ask this relationship. So the energy density should be related to the pressure with a factor that would be the dimension of the space. Here, the space of my Carolian space-time is the sphere, so it is two-dimensional. But there is this correction to the to the conformal uh, state equation. And this correction happens to play a role um, at the level of the charges. So um, I would interpret this as a sort of conformal uh, anomaly. So now, um, so in gravity, there is this uh, machinery uh, that, that is called the covariant phase space formal formalism and that can assign to an asymptotic killing, even if it's not an exact killing, it can assign to it a charge, but this charge is not always conserved, and one can show actually that this, the, the time evolution of this charge is directly related to uh, the conformal anomaly. So this is what I think. Sorry, what would you throw us? What S? What, what was S? S was here, sorry. Oh. It, the, it's what I want to okay. call the conformal yeah. anomaly. Yeah, it's radiation coming through, like, referring to vertices. Yeah, it's a, so, here you can see that the time derivative of S will make appear some, um, some spatial derivatives of the new tensor, which is the time derivative of the... Exactly. I call it conformal anomaly in the sense that this equation, uh, this equation should be 
the the equivalent of a tracelessness of an energy momentum tensor. But here I received this correction from my Why can't you shift that into E? Um, maybe I'm reading from these, but like, how do we know that E has to be defined as the first line and not shifted by some value of um, through its places in the conservation equation. Okay. It, 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 it appears through a time derivative, so you doesn't. Uh, I haven't found another. There is one way to describe the energy density for me. Okay. I can't, there's no invariance under okay. shifting. Or, okay. And so the non conservation of the charge uh, seems to be directly related to this uh, conformal factor. The control anomaly. Things underneath yeah, so right. the, usually people just say that the charges are not conserved because there is radiation that crosses the non-infinity. Yeah. But you have constructed charges as in the current physics, it's called the charge and charge, otherwise it's not Yeah, indeed. You, you can also, uh, so those charges are built out of an asymptotic killing uh, through uh, an. Uh, a procedure that refers to a bulk, but you can also uh, start from uh, scratch and wonder if I have a Carolian conservation law, what kind of charge can I build using Carolian killings? So the Carolian killing, where the, the killings that satisfy this equation. So the idea at the relat in the relativistic uh, world is that you project the killing on the DNRP momentum tensor. And here, one can show, but I haven't, I haven't written it here, that this charge can be understood as the projection of this killing on the Carolian momentum. It's exactly the same way that what happened in the relativistic world. So my goal now will be to understand better what is the meaning of this conformal anomaly at the level of the Carolian uh, theory on the null infinity. I would like also, or we would like also to extend those results to the non-linearized gravity, because for the moment everything was linearized, it was much simpler. We would like also to understand what are the possible implications for class holography, which means that the, the, a duality between an asymptotically flat uh, gravity and a non-gravitational theory living on the null infinity. For example, this would, it seems from this analysis that the dual theory should be considered, should be uh, some sort of ultra-relativistic uh, CFT. And the last thing we would like to do is to, to study other kind of null hypersurface and the first one that comes to my mind is the black hole horizon because it certainly has a a strong physical goal. Thank you. Questions? Were these curly E and curly P, were they defined in the bulk of the space time or already at infinity? So you can in make bulk, sense right? how you make, make you can make sense of them out of the bulk if you have another hypersurface. They, are, they can, can be built out of the extrinsic curvature extrinsic curvature of the null hypersurface. Here, what we have is the split, is a particular type of null hypersurface, is the null infinity, and I, ca I can define them through a, through a bulk perspective, yes. So what I'm wondering is the factor of two in your conformal anomaly, I would have expected a three from a space-time point of view, but since you are on a oh, null the, surface, the you get a factor of two. The factor of two refers to the space of the Carolian space-time, okay. okay. and the Carolian space-time here has uh, the sphere as a, as a space. <coughs> uh, the terms that Sebastian just asked about, so um, when, when they're um, at, at null infinity, <coughs> you get the physical interpretation through analogy with the, with the BMS terms, as far as I can tell. But how, 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 can you tell a similar story about how, ju how to justify the physical interpretation if, you're living, if they're living on a null hypersurface in the interior of space-time? No, I, I, I couldn't. The interpreting the physics of a Carolian world is a, is a bit tricky, I must say. Especially that I'm, I, I, I'm not extremely familiar with the, with the Carolian world, but for the moment, it's just, um, 
the idea was just to uh, to build what would be the ultra relativistic conservation law, <coughs> but I haven't any interpretation. So, uh, why would you be focusing on this conformal anomaly? Do you expect that in some limit the Carolian theory has conformal symmetry or something? Um, because the underlying theory uh, <coughs> don't have conformal symmetry. So the, the, the gravity theory. So the uh, 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 Carolian uh, cons conservation law could be perfectly uh, non-conformal. So that is not a problem. Uh -huh. The first thing that was interesting here is that this conformal anomaly is directly related to something which is the non-conservation of the charge. The second thing is that uh, in previous works, um, um, we have, with other people, we have understood that one, in some cases, can perform um, a, a weird limit, which, which is to, to take a, an ADS bulk solution and perform the limit constant cosmology goes to zero. This, at the level of the boundary, who is an ultra relativistic limit. Mm -hmm. So, um, in ADS world, we have the ADS CFC, and so we would expect, unless there's an anomaly, mm -hmm. that the energy momentum tensor on the boundary right. is traceless. Mm -hmm. And I want, somehow, I wanted this energy momentum tensor to be a putative ultra relativistic limit of a traceless relativistic energy momentum tensor. Mm -hmm. But here, there is a disconformal anomaly. So are you saying in that case you don't have gravitational waves? Uh, so in that case you have gravitational waves, uh -huh. but they, their contribution to the charge um, vanishes. Okay. Yeah. Well, but I mean, just to follow up on that, of course there is a conformal symmetry, right? You, you wrote down the generators. The, there is the, there's a conformal symmetry. Limit. There's no metric on that on the sphere at infinity. There, you know, the, you can take the sphere in, in any way. So there is a two-dimensional mm -hmm. yes. conformal symmetry. Yes. Is this anomaly? Are you trying to say that this anomaly is an anomaly in that symmetry, or you're using the word conf the conformal uh, here doesn't refer to that? So there, there are, I would say there are two. Uh, I have two understanding of the conformal symmetry here. It's or you consider just the sphere, and you have the 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 what is it the boost the super the super rotation that uh, that are conformal isometries of the of the of the sphere, but you can also consider a keying that that is not just a keying on the sphere, but also that has a leg on on the u uh, coordinate, so a keying of the whole uh, null infinity, and consider the conformal isometries of this geometry. So I add the time, time lapse now. So you're just saying like as you go along the infinity, each cross section of the mode doesn't behave like a nice... So, so like in the, in the way that we're trying to construct the plot based plot physiography, we have some notion of this celestial sphere being the S2, but right. we're incorporating all of the infinity in, in the spectrum of weights or something. <coughs> Versus here, yeah. like your anomaly is just the fact that radiation leaves through null infinity. Yeah. Um, so it's not a problem from our interpretation, but I guess okay. it's just a matter of how you're, I guess I don't know much about Co Carolinian theories to say what you're, how you're describing this as to as being a single cross-section and the fact that it changes over you is a problem. <coughs> yeah. I mean, if, like, I mean, if I charge not being conserved makes perfect the sense. The only thing I'm the, saying the is that if, if I consider an ultra, I yeah. consider these equations of yeah. motion, yeah. As ultra relativistic conservation law, sure. they are not, they the don't describe a right. conformally invariant Carolian yeah. theory. Sure. That's the equation of motion, yeah. if, if you work them out. So, let me continue. And the Carolinians, they would normally rely on like a, a 2 plus 1, or I guess 2 plus 0? These, for example, yeah. are vile invariant only yeah. if you have this relationship that I said. So basically it's epsilon equals minus trace of the subject. Minus two times tra the, of the trace of the subject. It's exactly the same thing that the trace estimation. Okay. But no, but I'm just saying that, the, the, that this is a three-dimensional theory and yes. things are leaving the theory because of the way that it's future null infinity, say. And 
Oh, 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 I'm just saying, for someone who does, deals with the 170 and body side of things, the fact that your charge isn't conserved is, makes perfect sense from the point of view of things leaving, yeah. like the 170 or they return time. And then I guess I would rephrase what you're saying is saying that, um, like, from the, whatever point of view the Carolinian like interpretation would go, it looks anomalous, but it's not. It's a, it would be a sickness of trying to interpret. So, uh, in, in, in your sense. work, yeah. in your perspective, yeah. Uh, how would you say that it's not anomalous? Because we have a different, I mean, okay. uh, we have conformal symmetry from the back to the super rotation. But these, are, like these that, are the symmetry. These are just, this, this like the Y <coughs> that you have, but like yes. the, the conservation, I mean, like but the, you can the, have the charge is supposed to. But when you have a, a CFT. We're, we're hoping to find a different charge, but it's not going to be, I guess, the same. Like, we're not looking at a Carolinian algebra, we're just looking at the aspect of the algebra and saying that there is a faulty C gets enhanced to zero charo for two copies of it. Yes. Right. And there's no inconsistency, that, I guess, so far in the algebra of, like, the YA. Okay, I think we should talk about this. Yeah, they're different. It's a matter of logic. But it's interesting how you're basically I think it's an anomaly, it's not the between the... Yeah, no. Yeah, it's just an anomaly, and your algebra is not being satisfied because of... It's not an anomaly that refers to the... Two CFT, yeah. two CFT, two dimensional CFT that lives on the sphere. Yeah, it's not. That's true. Right. No, it's not. Yeah, it's just in the algebra yeah. to describe it. Okay, really yeah. 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 for hosting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So what I want to talk about now is gravity, but there are very different gravities. So gravity for us is, is an experiment, the experiment where we use the telescope in Chile, which we operate here, and let me introduce a few people. So we are about 100 people in our collaboration, so we are experimental physicists, astronomers, and a few of those who, just for the highlight, Reinhard Benz, you know, who has discovered the hardest black hole in the center of the Milky Way, Oliver Pfuhl, Stefan Willis from Institute Jason Dexto, with a little people, Thibaut Kumar from Purvis, Andreas Eckert from Cologne, and then also a few others which are important. Ipa Bau, who is a co-author, Tim de Serbe, who was the director of ESO General at the time, who, who gave us very strong support in, in collaborators, and, and some who really make the instrument work, so Mr. Lafleur from Purvis, people needed ESO, and we should know all the sources from ESO. So the outline of my talk is... Sorry, is, sorry. Wh where is that? Uh, that one is in, in Chile. So this is where we then go every month to observe. So in South Africa, it's in, in the desert, very close actually to the sea. And when we go there, it's like at the west coast of the US. So the sea is very cold. So normally there, there shouldn't be clouds, but the, all the clouds are here <laughs> on the sea. So it's about 2,000 meters. So this is sea, but there are clouds usually. And then we, we build our our telescopes in Chile, it's a, it's a very good place. And so this is, but I was, I was told I should not speak about instrumentation, so I, I should speak about gravity, so the, the real gravity, not <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm getting on thinner eyes, that it's true, but I, will, I want to convince you that we now ever more get a strong case for the existence of the course, truly, and that the underlying physics, namely the general relativity is true, and what we, very specifically measured is, is the, the redshift in a supermassive black hole. So this is the first experiment which we've published last year. It can derive a little bit on, on violations of the basics and, and in particular the local position invariance from our experiment. We will not talk about much astrophysics. I 
they talk about the other highlight we had last year, which is about the existence of the black hole, that we, I would say, surprisingly, have seen motion <coughs> of the full Schwarzschild Treaty on an orbital, on, on orbit, only a few Schwarzschild Treaty away from the black hole. And, and so I will not talk about the outlook, which is actually what we want to do, is also to get a, a, a spin measurement, a model-free spin measurement of and then these, the, the orbital motion detections strongly indicate a, a face-on disk? Well, or, it. it's, it's or, or, or could there be independent, independent motions of the hotspots that don't necessarily have to have a, a, a disk? Or I think there can be other motions, certainly the base of the jet, the fuddle, can, can be maybe even in the jet. I, I don't want to stretch the interpretation too much. I want to show you what we observe. I think it's not what what, what theoreticians have, have expected, and we were also surprised, I come to a few of the aspects, why, why, why you should start thinking about what we see. I can only tell you what we see, but let's give a little bit of background. It's about, uh, it's, it's general relativity too, actually, how we did it. And see it as a black hole. And this is a plot which shows where it has been tested in a logarithmic scale of mass, and so this is the mass of our Earth, of stars, and of supermassive black holes. There's a million solar masses in the center of galaxies. And, and there are classical experiments here from Harvard, from a West Power experiment where you measure the redshift in the lab in a tower. The physics so building here. It's, yeah. uh, I don't know, it's a tower still? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so we are at the same level of precision now, but in the black hole. But mm -hmm. the was, and then there are all the, the tests in the solar system. Shapiro, do you know Shapiro? Hmm? <laughs> and so they, they had all the pulsars which have made a very strong case for it and got the prices. The gravitational redshift is a, a bit more tricky, so there is a little bit on, on white dwarfs, which already have a strong gravitational field, so that the, the lines are shifting, but they are difficult to measure. By the way, all the four points were in Massachusetts, discovered in Wait, which ones were in Massachusetts? Oh, fuck. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> no, I'm not sure about Sirius, but I, I think Sirius was the West Coast, was it? <laughs> It's up to you, but okay, so there, then there are also X ray astronomy actually starts <coughs> as a shift by interpreting the spectra. And what we want to cover is actually a pretty big parameter space which has not been probed. This is what you have in the galactic center. And, and we can probe such a big parameter space because we bridge all the scales from the orbits of stars at a few 10,000 Schwarzschild radii down to, to, to a few Schwarzschild radii. And for those who don't know the galactic center, so this is a, it's a super movie, and uh, the breakthrough was coming over the last 30 years, uh, roughly. So it started with, with getting infrared detectors available from the military, and then, and which made us look through the dust. So normally, there's, everything is shrouded in dust. There's a lot of dust on, on the line of sight. And then if you go to the infrared, if you see all the stars, you see that there's a center actually in the Milky Way. You see that there's a little star cluster, so you don't see a black hole, and then quite famous theoreticians did not expect a black hole for a long time because no jet is seen. And then so it really took until to the 90s, and it's back in the form. There's a technique to sharpen telescope, and the depth shifts became available, and then two groups in, uh, in UCLA around the Trier Gas and in Garching around Kaiser Grenzel and the Trier Snecker started to see stars move around. So these are real images, and, and so what you see here is, is that particular star which moves around every 20 years. And this is the black hole. Normally you don't see it. It's very faint in the black hole. But now with gravity, what we've been able is we, we can, we have improved the accuracy by, by factors 20, roughly to have sharper images and, and hundreds in how we can better measure things. This are now allowed us to do experiments. One is to measure redshift, and I'll show you quickly. And the other one is, this is a, a half artist impression of, to see something move on the orbital motion. And the background is a tool, uh, image key simulation, but what we see is a, a, a motion, a circular motion. 
What are those frequencies of, that we, you were looking at for the stars in the middle? That last uh, two microns, so this is at, at infrared wavelengths. So a little bit beyond the, the optical range. It's not total emission. It's still the, the same physics as in the visible, but uh, you can look through the dust. Okay. And then the things which we can address here on, on the more fundamental side is very far in is, is where you see this shadows from the black hole where the event horizon telescope we, 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 we is going to you see orbital motion this is what I'll show you here <coughs> when things shine up and if you go a little bit farther out and this is the machine where we are coming here so we can measure the beta square effects it's the gravitational redshift <coughs> it's the Pari Astron shift and where we want to get is to our lens searing position is the, so how the orbit changes by the spin of the, the black hole so that work to measure the redshift that she dedicated a paper to Tal Alexander, so he's a theoretician from, from Israel, who put us on, on the right track and so in, with his at that time Shai Zucker poster. He, he had the vision that if you measure, measure well enough the radial velocity of the stars when you move in, you should see actually a deviation from the Keplerian orbit from the gravitational redshift. In the, the, the signature is actually very strong, it's 200 kilometers per second, which for us should be easy to measure. But that he, he realized that at that time we had that, but we could not break the degeneracies because you don't know the distance to the black hole, you can tilt the orbit a little bit, and then, then a Keplerian orbit looks like a relativistic orbit. And the way to do that is either you have several stars, so one fixes the black hole, the other one you measure, or you, you are super precise, and at that time we could not really envision that you are super precise, but this is what we've now been in. And so the experiment is you measure the orbit on sky, then you know the orbit, and then you measure the radial velocity, and then you look <coughs> on the deviation of the radial velocity. So radial velocity is like Doppler effect, the clock, and if the clock goes slower, you will see a, a deviation. And, and this is the experiment that you do. You measure and you look what's going on, but the problem now is that the scale is that star moves at a, moves as close as a thousand Schwarzschild radius, the speed is about uh, two, two and a half percent the speed of light, so 8,000 kilometer per second, but the system is so far away that, that it's so small that this is the, the sharpness of a normal mm -hmm. telescope we have, of a 10 meter telescope like, like Keck or ours in parallel. It is not good enough in and so the breakthrough we could make in the last years is we could build an instrument where we combine the lights from the, the four telescopes in Chile, so you bring it together and you make a, a Michelson experiment in, in, in a way. So you over, overlay the light from the telescopes, and you measure interference, and from the strength and the position of the interference, you, you get sharper and, and better. And, and so this is then how it looks like. All of that is within the sharpness of a single telescope, these are the observations from the last two years. So these are, are two images from us. And what you see is that the star now is moving. It's getting way from way down <coughs> here. It's getting around 30, 8,000 kilometers per second. And it's moving out. And this allows us now to, to this. Didn't you say a few minutes ago that there was something that was a few Schwarzschild radius? I'll come to that. Right okay, now so we this are from this one. Okay. So we measure the separation between the black hole and the star. Yeah. For the moment, everything moves smooth along a, a Kaplan orbit. And the smoothness so, is from months to days, and, and this just to illustrate how much better we do compared to, to, to 50, uh, well, 20 years ago. This is what we have with adaptive optics, and this is now this little fly spots is, is what we have now. Right, friend, you have the, there are many post corrections, right? Mm -hmm. So um, is the gravitational redshift the most significant? Significant one, or is it uh, down the list of the ones that you? No, get? it's the well, it, it's the beta square tau. So these are the first real ones. Right. There are two. There's actually a special relativistic one, which is the transverse Doppler effect, but it's exactly the same amount. So when we talk about gravitational redshift, we really mean the sum of transverse Doppler effect plus gravitational oh. redshift is what what what. The, the equivalence principle would predict. I, I'm not even saying GR, but I'm trying to, to be simple in the language. 
mit so was wie auch will. Ich möchte wie Sie das da aufstehen bei denen, das was im April, das was im Mai, so das ist ein wenig bei den Days. Und so wie der Experiment war, das ist zu illustriert, haben wir schon besser wie du. Und dann du tust das Experiment, so das ist ein simple picture of that. Du measure the radial velocity, you fill the Newtonian orbit, you subtract that orbit, and so this is the deviation from a capillary orbit. And when you're far away, you don't see GR in special relativity really much, but when you get close, and you, when there's an uncertainty in the fit, and you, you have especially around pub, you don't know really how it should look like, and then what you measure is actually, so this is Newtonian, and this is what you measure, and so this is the signature of the general relativistic redshift, so uh, time goes slower, close to the black hole, and uh, a proper way is to include it as a parameter and then have a posterior distribution, all this Monte Carlo things I, I don't like, honestly, but uh, all the signature was here, and this is not a proper analysis, but what I should take away is here a 20 signal <laughs> right now, and, and there, it, for us there was no way to do it with the single telescopes, and I, and the, the reason is that these orbits are so degenerate between what you see here and the Newtonian one, if you just tip it a little bit, this is probably the reason why our we see colleagues are more careful and you know, need to be more careful with the data. And so then you can do a little bit more, so when you measure the radial velocity, actually you have two atomic lights on this hydrogen, this one is helium, and then you can do the same experiment again like in Harvard and then and then power so you, you can make the same experiment, the redshift for two blocks, one here and one here, and what you do is you compare how does the redshift changes for the two blocks, so it's a double, double differential experiment, and, and it's, it's known as a test for the local position invariant, so it's physics different in different strengths of, of gravitation field, and, and so this is, so you fit it, as, and uh, a zero is, this is what we have, so, that, so it's not different. Helium and hydrogen blocks work the same, no matter in what field. And, and so in, in, in a similar parameter space as we had before, so now what we plot here is the change of gravitational field. So the traditional experiment side, uh, you, you make experiment on Earth, and you go a little bit around elliptically around the sun, so the Earth orbit is, is not fully circular, it goes a little bit in and out, and then you check how your clocks go in summer and in, in winter, and if they go at the same speed, then it's, it's fulfilled. And, and so here you get two positions which are for orders of magnitude better, but actually to, to get to a, a regime where the field changes, uh, like in the galactic center, up to 10,000 kilometer per second equivalent, then, then we are alone, and the position which we have is actually, again, very, very similar to what you had in your tower over there, which I should visit. <laughs> okay, and, and so yeah, now you can do a few few interpretations of that. You can see how big is the deviation between, our, or how much deviation can we allow, and then you can interpret and say as a Yukawa potential as, as one empirical description of the many theories which could see a deviation from. From GI. And this is experiments which are typically you do with laser ranging, you shoot to special satellites which look like a golf golf ball. So this is a dose ones or to the moon, which are the green curves and so what we now get. So this is a plot from uh, from uh, from his is now back in progress. And actually so we, we start to cut down on, on how strong that that uh, the carbon potential can be here. Uh, near star, but you see we, we are probing a range which has not been probed before, and it's in a similar scene. And then you can think about what black holes exist, could it be wider the black holes for us astrophysicists were important, how does this black hole build up, and, and this is um, already a 10 years older plot, where there are constraints, could there be a binary black hole from Mark, so from the motion of the black hole in the radio, you, you can exclude, so to say, a mass which moves it around, and, and you can take a long perspective view over five years. How what is the how little it has moved in one direction? This gives you this <coughs> five 
the, the three curves. So what you see here is the separation of a hypothetical second black hole and the mass of the second black hole. And then you can also look at how much it's shaking around. This gives you an other line here. And so far, this part is working well excluded, but there's enough space available for very close binary holes <coughs> actually of substantial mass, so intermediate mass because of 10 or 100 hours solar masses, and now we are cutting down by seeing that our orbit looks so like a point mass in the center. We can repeat in a way the experiment from our tweet and the chill over here, and you can see how much do we chitter around the orbit with these lines, and, and so what you will find now is actually there's not, not much space left if there is a, a binary black hole so on a, a few months or on a year time scale orbit is the one which we have difficulty to prove because it's shattered with what we measure in these two years. So you're getting to the regime of stellar mass, black holes almost. Oh. Eventually. About 10,000 or I stellar black hole. Let's be honest, I think that the stellar mass black hole is here. Right. We, we don't just in macro <laughs> <laughs> I, I, No, I let you dream, but I, I want to be honest. No, we, we, are, uh, we would be happy if we can exclude intermediate mass black holes. And it should be somewhere. And, and so. so the different bands are different amounts of data, is it? Uh, uh, this is what we can. That's what you have now and and this is what you will get. Uh, I think in 10 years it's yeah. more uh, a better how well we trust our upper pass. Okay. But, but there is another re region here, which is gravitational waves time this, scale. It's a stability argument. How right. long? They would not live very long. They would not live very long. But right. uh, you see, I have a hands on. I can want to measure, not calculate. Okay. Even so 10 million years is not longer to be with you. It's Where is the 10 billion years line? It would be way above. Yeah, but this is a very different time scale. You're because the, right, the relaxation types need to bring the black hole in there. So this is the gravitational waves, which you right. understand. But how to bring, uh, so you take a satellite galaxy, like, right. like the Magellanic clouds, how do you bring the black hole to the, to the center of our galaxy? Is, well, these are global clusters, a few thousand. Yeah. I bet we don't know. We have lots. Uh, if the MC population holds so for, for the non astronomer, we, we have a certain expectation value of how massive the coal should be. But we, we have not found it yet. Um, and so now I come to, to the other case now for the second topic is so this is a, a plot which shows how confident that we are that there's a black hole. And so you see the radius, the structure radius from a, a million to a thousand to one, and so you measure the, the enclosed mass, and so farther out there's still a stellar cluster, you see it, and the closer you go in at around a, a pass, and you only see the black hole as a gravitational potential. But where we measure the mass, we are still a long way from the, from the event horizon, and the argument why we think it's a black hole is that there is a, is a size from the radio, and the radio is not shaking, so chilling tell you all of that. And, and, but, but in a way, this is a, is, a, is a lower limit of what you get of 100,000 with solar masses. So, so now we want to get a, a dynamic mass here, a steering mass measurement at the last in the orbit. And now I come to your question. So now we do a different experiment. You see the black hole flicker. And while it flickers, so we measure the separation between the two, we now look not every day but we, we look every five minutes, and if you have some short exposures, there was actually there was expectation to see orbital motion, because in 2003, Ryder Benson has observed this quasi-periodic signature in such a flare, and, and in Army, and, 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 and the postdoc at, at this time, they, they made already at that time the model of a orbiting spot, uh, explaining that light curves from, from Doppler boosting, from the periscope uh, made the, the same for us to actually propose gravity for that. So the instrument was built on the picture. And, but then we, we, I think we, we lost confidence that this picture is right. And the, the reason was that 
to measure these QPOs to find the significance is very difficult. If something is only three orbits long, then you never know if what you see is red noise or whether it's in the toes or the engineers of you. I have a feeling how difficult it is. And indeed, actually, it looked more like there is no QPO, so you have you don't have the, the beaming effects from the orbit approaching. And the other thing is that, that we were learning, not we, <laughs> you were learning so much more about how potentially a black hole accretion could look like, and it will be hot and thick, puffy, or it could be, so it could be either puffy and thick, and you wouldn't expect spots, so to say, to orbit, or it could be very complex, and so we actually did not uh, anticipate what we've seen, and this is what, then what we've seen. So this now points measured every five minutes of the position of the, the light coming from the black hole. And so what you see, the centroid of this light is, is moving in a, in a circle. So this was for 45 minutes, and, and so qualitatively what you've seen is it moves by a uh, good hundred micro arc second on sky. This is comparably to 10, ten Schwarz and 3D, and it takes 45 minutes, it goes in a circle. So this is 30% of the speed of light around something. And now, so, so, so far, so good, actually, but, but we, we did not really believe it in initially because of the arguments before, but then we have seen more noisy, but the pattern, 100 micro second clockwise, we've seen it a little bit later, a few days, and, and then back in the data a little bit earlier, and, and, and I'm bringing that, so in other elements now we see, we do not only see the circle, but actually that original picture which triggered the hope to see it, that there's a Doppler boosting, Probably is not the case because the light curve that is shown here actually is not tracing the, the orbital period. Actually, the, the modulation is not so high in these two cases. These were faint flares, it was of the order of three, the peak to value in brightness, which means actually the doctor boosting does not play so a big role. So it, it also matches that, that we are more face on. You, you asked that before. And then there was another thing which we didn't like is we measure polarization of our instrument, like in the radio, and, and we describe that by Stokes parameter. So you have a parameter which tells you how vertical or horizontal the, the emission is, or how 45 in that direction or in that direction is. These are called Stokes parameter. And so what we've seen is that while the, the, the flare was moving once around it at one hour, the Stokes parameter was, the polarization was also moving once around in the Stokes one, but this is it's not what you expect because if you think the magnetic field is is pulled with the matter, so you have a toroidal field, the electric field will be perpendicular from the synchrotron emission. So already after half revolution, you've got one way around here, and, and actually what we now now see, so you would expect two of these loops, so the radio astronomers can can appreciate that lot, but. I, so what it did not fit, it did not fit that. So a, uh, a toroidal magnetic field plus synchrotron just do the job and then chase and extra. This was the notation during this models at our institute. And he actually had a, a solution for that is if you are phase on enough and if the magnetic field is an ordered magnetic field perpendicular to the to the big plane, actually there is double loops get get little x and the, the, the second small loop you, you don't notice anymore. And the reason for that is actually is, is light bending effects. You see kind of the, the electric field vector to bend around with space time and light is, is traveling along. And so this is puzzling and it is because it requires a, a ordered magnetic field. We, <coughs> we have some hope that or we, we know that it's probably ordered a little bit farther out there, so this millions Schwarzschild radii, there's a pulsar, and you can measure the radio uh, how much magnetic field is there by rotation dispersion measure, and then you can, can extrapolate what it would be in, and then you, you come to the right, right order of magnitudes for the magnetic field, what you would need for, for our emission, and uh, a few Schwarzschild radii. And also, actually, some of you are here from the paper, so who called himself or her, I don't know, but 
Da hat es so welche Lücke Polarisation auf die Welthorizon Teleskop so zu 30 Gigahertz Polarisation und große Deck Polarisation da will was indicating that all the magnetic fields would be before the key to explain this observation is it but it's still so so the the, the art what is for then I'm looking to have a so this magnetically arrested disk have this kind of things that the magnetic field is ordered, so this very strong fields, but not too strong to still get the, the matter in. But what we do not have yet as intuition is whether actually the, they are poloidal enough or is, or is there too much toroidal still in it? Because the toroidal you will always have if matter moves in. So this is what we try, but what we observe this is what I can see and almost end my, my talk is everything what we've seen is it's it's all consistent with a, a near phase on circular orbit close to a few Schwarzschild radius is what we call a innermost state orbit and it is shown in this plot here so this is the, the distance from the black hole the last state orbit is a three Schwarzschild radius or three uh, six gravitational radius and we see a motion so don't you need to know the spin of the black hole in order to determine how close the... the, 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 the separation the spin actually makes work a little, uh, has work a little impact on the, the circular velocity of the, the objects. You would have to... I hope I... I'm looking if I have a, a block. See, if you... Uh, not a super plot. So what you see here is the, the separation and the orbit period. And so this is the line, let's take the, the red line. So this is a non-spinning black hole, which has the innermost state orbit the three Schwarzschild radius, and the maximum spinning black hole. So the main difference is you can go farther in. So there are orbits allowed farther in. You can have shorter periods. But <coughs> you're out there, so the lines are working close, and you see it also yeah, in the we are that lines, I think what we conclude, it can be both, it can be a spinning black hole, it, it can even, we could allow for retrograde and prograde, this we, we cannot distinguish, could also go that honestly, but, but this is why I'm describing the facts, not the interpretation, I would say we see circular motion on that scale, which is almost Kaplerian in speed, and but if it is uh, black hole will spin, then say something about the direction of that spin. Right, right now, the the not, we would need more of these flares to, well, to, to try to see the more subtle signatures. So the, the signatures from the spin are of the order micro arc seconds in the imaging world, so to say, on the. We, we are not there yet. I, I think uh, two things can help. So, how many flares have you actually seen so far? Three. Reason. Not super good ones. I think the one which was so clearly yeah. roundish was the best. It was not yet on the level like, say, the discovery flare from 2003, which. So we, we probably have not seen yet this very spotty objects yet. So And those three flares were over how many observations? Uh, well, the one was in May and two in July. So every time you look, there is a flare, is it? No, because okay. we looked uh, a year before, and okay. there was no flare, or, or we didn't trust the data. Okay. I think we are also getting more and more trust with the redshift. That, that, that the fact that, that Einstein is right also made you believe a little bit more in your upper bars, and then you, 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 you start to... So, uh, is there also evidence for an outflow pointing uh, close to our line of sight, and Maybe there could be features related with the outflow. If somehow there's some peel of the outflow that's uh, pointing towards our line of sight, maybe that could appear as a flaring if something things are boosted towards us. I, I, I don't know how how high up a, on the on the equatorial plane we are. It could also be in the funnel of the jet. I, I think it cannot be very far because the from the orbit, we know where the black hole is, so to say, and so what we see is actually pretty close to the predicted position of the mass, so it, we are not a 10, 10 Schwarzschild radio we And you're so close that you even see some effect of the light bending around the gravitational potential. Uh, you, you, you would uh, very quickly, if you're more phase 
uh, edge on, then you see the way of motion, which looks like this, this Torero uh, head. But well, all the four things which we see that the magnetic field only rotates once in, in the Stokes world uh, makes it no inclination. So this is this this hashed region here. So this is parabola space radius of what we see in the equation. So the radius is given by the orbital scale and by the size. This is the the, the, the orbit, so the pure astrometry, that the polarization can be can be only one loop, would, would put it farther, would put it roughly that machine, and that actually that we see very little Doppler beaming, so the, the brightest to the faintest part, all puts us, us here, so we are at this 20 degrees, is what I now would bet pretty face on, and, but this is not what we, was the expectation value, as you say, in other black hole which looks to us. Well, you keep referring to the jet, but mm -hmm. if it was really a then you don't on, see it. Then it would be like a blazer situation, yes. and, ah. and, and, and the jet would be quite distinct as, as a signature uh, of the emission from there. We don't. Uh, is there any evidence for a jet? There is no jet. There's the jet, but I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. But I think the picture like of the blazer is not correct mm -hmm. for this kind of uh, accretion rate. So here the, the base of the jet is. In the Look on the high uh, Falkis paper. He, he would say you can't see the, play, the, the jet if you are face on, or you cannot distinguish it. It's, it's faint. The double boosting is not so well, large. At, at some point, you know, when you don't see something, then it doesn't exist. Right? No, it's small. Mm. This is wider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then you need a sharper telescope. No, I. And will EHT be able to help? Uh, yes, but I am unbiased. There's no opinion whether there is a jet or not. I mean, 90% of I all AGMs don't have jets, so why should we just the one next to us that has jets? Okay. Let's call it, we all would agree that there's outflow, so matter must come out. Now the question is how polymated is this coming out? And then look on your colleagues over here for, I think if you come from this, picture which had before where you have a very hot and thick thing coming in the, the funnel is also not so sharp in the sense that it may not appear as a place. I think this is the argument from Heidel actually that you don't see it if it's if it's going towards you. You actually don't cannot distinguish it from the point source so to see. Because you see only the very inner part of the jet, the base of the jet and then it's on top of the radio emission so you don't know what what you see in the, the millimeter, is it the, the, the creation or is it the, the outgoing part of the particles? So, so e even if we get something that's relatively based on this, still. Richard, uh, is the talk over? Yeah, I have almost life, but this is not really. So we can yep. do the discussion. Yeah, please, please. Okay, go ahead. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, hold on. So, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so e even if you have uh, something that's based on, there's still a degree of freedom where it has 360 degrees of uh, freedom to be pointed towards or away from us. Is there any uh, information based on how elliptical the cross section uh, or the projection appears that would constrain uh, whether it's sorry whether it's it's not only based on but also pointed in our direction or is it uh, rotated. Uh, it, it, it. Okay, so if it's say at this twenty degrees, now you are asking in which direction that one would point. Whether we could distinguish. I mean, just it seems unlikely that it would be like. Should we should comment there? I think in the radio there are some indications where there's a little bit more elongation towards the the, the west. <laughs> Just a little bit, though. Uh, a, a little bit, so you. But it's mostly, so it, it's almost circular. It's almost arching. Because it would seem very almost unlucky. Almost circular. That, so it would seem like we'd be very lucky if it's yes. almost circular, and it's it's uh, face on. So it seems like very almost. We would be very lucky to be within this twenty degrees. Yes. But uh, what we see now, I think for the bottling of the SEP, this could be uh, one of the ways if you have the right model, the check model, very, 
very nicely fits the spectral energy distribution, so you get depending, so you go geometrically out and you change the optical thickness and the, so to say the temperature and simple ones of what you see. So there's a very predictive model of the jet, how the LCD would look like. And if you are actually, if it approaches you, it would nicely fit the spectral energy distribution. This is like the high of Falke world, I would say, of, of fitting it. But then you can take a accretion world. This was a picture which I wore ahead. So a garbage world, the things go in. And then you would actually also can come to a very similar LCD. You need to tweak a little bit, so we need some more highly relativistic electrons, so which are not part of the, the normal equipment of the normal temperature in the degree. So both would work and then now the EHT tries to figure out which one yeah for B. Mm -hmm. so, I, uh, I, I think this is obviously <coughs> an interesting topic, but uh, Frank is here for the whole week, so um, I think it's kind of stuck to him. So the polarization is really amazing. The fact that it's got this peculiar uh, geometry. But I didn't understand the explanation you gave. You said Jason Dexter has a model. Yes. What is the model? How does it not rotate twice? <laughs> it rotates twice. I'm not sure if I, I can explain it well. So it still rotates twice. Okay. But now if you... So, so to see the synchrotron efficiency of that salt yeah. from the gravitational light bending, you, you look a little bit from that side. So you, you bend in. So you look on the side on that. And what you find, so the more is using you, it creates additional acimutal component to the polarization which you add on that. So one side disappears. And then you, you print it on that. But this only works with, with this ordered vertical field, with the, with the toroidal field, which I told you, it does not see that. So it's always dominating the stuff. This is published, is it? Yeah. No. The description is published, but the model is not. So what you're currently doing is trying to fit a parameter okay. fit. Yes. And, and so this is with okay. the student. He, working on that. Okay. But it's a, a tricky thing and you, you have to, yes, you have to, to con I don't know if construct, but it's not uh, expected geometry. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. no, thank you. Another opportunity to, to talk with Frank is we can, uh, we'll be taking him to dinner, so if you're interested, let me uh, know. I'm so busy now I'm working with Andy's company. Oh, how are you? I'm working with Oh, good. Okay, busy. Oh, good. Okay, congratulations. Wow, amazing. Okay, good. Yeah. So Charles works on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we see this. And you see, yeah, she didn't tell you. Yeah, I'm actually interested to see what are the observations of the signatures that you can really see, you know, their parameters. I think it's a... So the like, 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 yeah, but not not uh, gra I see what you mean. I, I know a little bit about gra um, about the uh, yeah about the memory index, but Michael yeah. wasn't able to see. I, I don't know because it's like permanent permanent.
Yeah, but I I still have it. I still have it. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 Yeah.